get more confidence, get that promotion, get moving up the corporate ladder, get a better gig with an MBA from Mays Business School at Texas A&M University. Whether you're starting out or stepping up, now you can take your career to a whole new level with a full-time MBA in College Station and convenient weekend options at Houston City Center. Texas A&M has a program to suit your schedule. Visit mba.tamu.edu. And Giga Maggie. Howdy, welcome to May's Mastercast. I'm Shannon Deer, the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Programs. I've made a job change, and I'm here with your Stupendous host, Ben Wiggins. Good morning, Shannon, and congratulations. Thank you. I think are in order. Thank you. I'm excited, excited, excited. So, yeah. We are excited for you. Thank you. Thank you. And glad to be here with you. Glad to be here with you as well. And it is a beautiful day in Aggie Land. It is truly a beautiful day in Aggie Land. Today on the show, we have a fantastic guest, Tony Okaramadu. He is an executive assistant professor in the Department of Finance and the assistant director of the corporate banking program here at Mays. Tony has many years of international management experience in diverse industry sectors, having worked in financial services, technology, business, and management consulting. He has also worked in economic development, executive education, media, and nonprofits. He brings a great international business focus to May's Business School, looking at markets and economics and finance are all part of his specialties. His book on emerging African economies and their markets were published in London, and it is currently a resource for companies in over 22 countries, helping them make business decisions involving Africa. You'll hear a lot about Tony's background growing up in Nigeria, living in London, and then moving to Texas A&M University, whoop, where he met his lovely wife. They currently live in Houston with their beloved miniature schnauzer, Eleanor. And we are excited to welcome Tony and his global perspective and his five languages. He has a very impressive background and perspectives that he brings to Maze and to the Mastercast. We hope you enjoy the episode. Let's get into it. Thanks for listening. We welcome Tony Okoromaru to the show. How are you doing? I'm all right. Thank you. Monday morning, 8 a.m. Not exactly the sprightliest of uh, moments, but I'm getting there. (laughs) Yeah, same here. What is your favorite superpower? To change people's minds and turn them to the good from um, the sort of mischievous inclinations we all get to. Interesting. That, I, I don't know if we've ever had that answer before. We've had, we've had understanding people and so forth, but, uh, but like telepathic, I guess, um, I don't want to say manipulation, but, uh, but telepathic <laughs> influencing, perhaps. Uh, influencing. That's, yeah, yes. that, that's an interesting one. What would, what would be the first thing you would, you would do with that? I'd, 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 make, I'd make everyone see that we're all better off when we work towards a common good, even if there are um, bits and pieces here and there where one might gain, one might lose. But overall, we all come out on top when we work together. I think that's so that true. Fantastic, is it? <laughs> yes, something I read some research recently that says. Uh, people are Republicans and Democrats, for example, are not as far apart as they think they are on certain issues. And they also think that the other that members of the other party, that people whose political inclinations are different from theirs, dislike them far more than those people actually dislike them. So everyone thinks that we are farther apart and hate each other more than we actually do. I wouldn't doubt that at all, because it. um Right, background. My wife's American. Indeed, my wife's uh, Caucasian American. Uh-huh. And um, when we met and uh, got to her family and so on, and obviously we got very close, um, and when, when I discussed with her and her family, they were usually surprised at the perspective of someone coming to America from outside or someone looking into America from outside and yeah. seeing that Americans are are closer than they believe they are. Yeah. You know, they share the same desires, the same 
overall more or less principles that they, and they're magnanimous, even though they think uh, some are not. So it's just, it's amazing to see that the divisions are more inside of ourselves, more contrived than I think they actually exist in reality. Huh. Yeah, yeah. Fascinating stuff. Tell our listeners where you, where you grew up. Um, my formative years were, were in Nigeria, um, where I was born. And then I um, did a bit of wandering, if you like. I, uh, I, I moved around a bit, so I hadn't discovered America. I'd always been, been intrigued by America, but I'd never quite been. And I thought, well, that just might be the next stage of, of my adventure, as it were. I quite literally packed my bags in feet and, and moved over here. Quite literally. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Out of curiosity. And, and then what, from there, what eventually brought you to Maze? What, what was your journey from there? When I moved over to America, again, something that, in this case, the eye-opener was on, on my side. The rest of the world think that um, we know America because we watch Hollywood, we follow American politics, American culture is very diffusive and so on and so forth. But not until you do set foot here, do you realize just, for example, how vast the country is. I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's humongous. The second shocking thing I'd say, especially when you're coming from an English speaking background, is how different the English is. You know, you're speaking the same, using the same words, actually, let's just say, <laughs> using the same alphabets, the same um, pronunciation, more or less, the same general grammar, but you're saying completely different things. And uh, that could get really confusing. But um, I, I immediately realized, though, that if I was going to get to know America, the best thing might be to go back to grad school. And mm. so, and I was up in the Northeast at this point in New York. And I thought, all right, go back to school, go do a master's, um, get to know America from inside, as it were. I'd always been, been um, fond of education anyways. Um, and so I, I applied to various universities, um, got admission to various parts of the country. I had no idea what part of the country was what. So what I did was um, I made a spreadsheet of um, a sort of cost-benefit analysis. Um, university of higher admission, cost of living, and so forth. And oh, yeah. One this, you speak my language. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Up at the top popped out somewhere called Texas A&M University College Station. Yeah. I'd, I'd never thought about coming down to Texas. It just wasn't on my radar at all. But cost benefit, it, it suited me. So I said, all right, I guess I'm going down to Texas. Um, and I came down here and, and I don't exaggerate when I say this, but it's probably the most singular, um, most consequential decision I ever made in a positive sense. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll look back on that day and, and thank my lucky stars that I, that I came down here. But fundamentally, it, it, led me, it led me to my wife, you see. And that's, 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 that's the centerpiece of my world. And I wouldn't have met her if not for Texas A&M. I, I, I would not at all. And that's a, A&M has brought everything to me quite yeah. naturally. I know the feeling. I know that mm -hmm. feeling well. Tell us about your adventures with um word with different words uh, being used oh, I see. different ways in different places because there was a time um at home this time um we're downstairs and my wife needed something from her from her purse she said so she says to me Tony, could you please grab my my purse it's upstairs um so i doubt upstairs where is it in the living room upstairs i doubt upstairs and i look around and i don't see her purse and I come back down and say, I, I don't think it's there. I can't, I can't see it. And she goes, no, it's there. It's, it's sitting right there on, on, the, on the couch. I dab back upstairs. I, I don't see her purse. So I go, look, um, heart, it's not, it's not there. She goes, oh, it is there. And then she stomps up the stairs. She says, this is the purse. And I go, but that, that's a handbag. Goes, no, <laughs> it's a purse. And I go, no, inside the handbag is supposed to be a purse. Because the purse is like a lady's wallet. And she says, no, this is a purse. Oh, dear. <laughs> and there were just several, you know, I, I remember once, too, at, uh, it was at a Walmart. We had gone shopping for some essentials at Walmart. We discovered we didn't, we didn't have a credit card. So um, we left the, the uh, you got, we left the, let's just say the truck where you put things inside. That's still thing that you roll on the floor where you pile all your, um, your, your purchases. Right. We left them in the corner with customer service and said, we're going to be back. We're just going to go back to the hotel, grab a, grab a credit card. And I come back and I'm trying to explain to them, 
lady behind customer service, um, listen, I, I came a few minutes ago and I had a trolley with blah, blah, blah. <laughs> she was just staring at me and a colleague was next to her and then she turns to the colleague and says, listen, if you understand what he's saying, kindly attend to him because I can't make out a word of what he's saying. <laughs> so I learned, we don't say trolley, we say cart. And so I left a cart and so on and so forth. So it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah uh, you, were driving, you were driving a vehicle around in the store with... Uh... <laughs> 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 yeah, well, that, that's just, yeah, yeah, there are many things. How many in your family growing up? We're five kids. Uh, we are five kids. I have an elder sister, then comes me, um, a younger brother, and two younger sisters. Uh, my, my parents, uh, let's say my, my mom became a single parent, if you like, at 41, because unexpectedly my father died in a car crash. It okay, was, sorry. that was, um, I mean, it was, a, it was one of those things. You know, when it happens, you think, gosh, I only ever read about stuff like this in the newspapers. You don't expect it to happen to you. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was a happy nuclear family and all that. Um, and it was on a trip with, with, with one of my uncles, his brother, and a sister of his, so my aunt, the three of them, making a road trip. And they had a car crash two days after Christmas. And um, that was it. We didn't learn of it until two days or so afterwards because it happened in, a, in another part of the country and, and so on. And so we were fit, faced with that um, reality, if you will, and uh, had to grow up quickly, you see. And, and um, yeah, so my mother, I, I don't quite know how she did it, but um, she, she raised five of us, put us through college uh, and all that. And I, I like to think that we turned out okay. Um, but, yeah, she's, she's, she always reminds me of, you know, the, the, the strength of um of motherhood it's i think us guys sometimes we don't we underestimate that too often but a woman is as a i don't know but the backbone of the of the home quite easily um yeah, yeah. so that's yeah that's um we, we are we're all over the place though my uh, my brother and i um he's still in europe but he, he's moved now he, he was he lived in england they live in luxembourg now and yeah then i am here um and my my but my mother and my sisters are, are back in Nigeria. So, um, yeah, we crisscross. I um, had several Nigerian friends in California, and it seems like um, there is a, a fair bit of tie with Europe. Like a couple of them had family in Europe as well and other, in other parts of the U.S. What is it about the Nigerian culture specifically that, you know, like it's of, of all – countries in other parts of the world, Europe, uh, Africa, Asia, um, Nigerians seem particularly global, particularly yeah. worldly. What, what is it about the are, culture that leads to that? You're correct in observing that. Um, and again, it was just one of those things that the one takes for granted until, say, a question is posed, like the one you just, you just did. Yeah. Um, Nigerians, particularly people from a section of Nigeria, um, are very enterprising. Okay. I mean, they are very few things don't Nigerians, if you will. They they can, and I mean this even literally. Um, and I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm of Nigerian heritage, but there's no obstacle that they cannot overcome. I mean, nothing nothing deters them, and mm. they are adventurous. There's a mm. Nigerian every corner of the planet. I think that the most nomadic, if you put it that way, of all um, African um, peoples, if you will. Yeah. Uh, so it's the enterprising spirit in them. It's the indomitable um, character that they've got. And those are all positive qualities. Although in my view, they can also become like um, an albatross around your neck because the fact that you're indomitable, the fact that you have that spirit that says, it, you, you, it, you can never die, so to speak, um, sort of can make you put up with, with things that you shouldn't tolerate, especially in terms of governments and um, um, governance, um, societal arrangements, stuff like that. What have been your most important lessons from childhood? I, I think it goes back to, to, um, to my family circumstances. And again, I think to take for granted until uh, you find yourself discussing this with somebody and you realize it may not be so common. Um, my right. father, for example, after my father died in that car crash, 
Yeah. A few, few days after after that, um, at home, my mother and he was he hadn't been buried yet. My mother gathered my elder sister, myself, and my younger brother. We were the three eldest. So my elder sister was nineteen years old. I was seventeen. My younger brother was fourteen. Yes. The other two were, were too young in my mother's estimation at the time. And she sat us down in our bedroom to tell us a bit about my father's life. Um, things my father apparently had not wanted to talk about because he was waiting for us to, to get older. And one of the things was that my grandfather, that is my, my father's father, had been gruesomely murdered. Indeed, not, he had been beheaded. His Goodness. body was never found. Um, my father's mother, so my grandmother, had to gather her children, abandon the part of the country where she had only ever known, and move them elsewhere because of this. And my father never breathed a word of that to us. Um, and it had, she also told us about one or two other instances in his life that we were shocked to discover. And she said to us, you know, the three of you, this is important because he wanted you to learn how to forgive. He didn't want you to grow up bearing grudges. That's talk with us and so there was i a 17 year old kid i obviously i didn't know what the rest of life was going to bring for me but i've had several instances obviously since then to reflect on that and to find strength in that and to think to myself if my father could do this then surely whatever it is i'm struggling with right now um will pale in comparison um but that said, I think that, that must have been when the seed of perhaps a um, sense of social responsibility and the prioritization I gave that was was sown in me. Things you don't notice, obviously, um, as you grow up. But this morning, I don't know why, I was thinking about that. And it, 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 you, it is the same line, if you will, that runs through my siblings. Um, somehow. Uh, and I'm very happy to observe this, they, they have a sense of empathy. They have a sense of, of fairness about them. They, they have a, the, the desire to see things with objectivity, the desire to, to build society in any which way they, they could. Um, and that, that pleases me very much. Um, yeah, it's a value I've come to, I guess, to cherish. You spoke about my sister. And uh, yes. you know, I, I guess everyone, everyone's like, it just happens to everyone. The things that you, as you grow up, obviously you take for granted. For example, if I go on to my sister, I, I took for granted what a family is. I didn't oh. know that not everyone, sadly, not everyone had a home that they were looking to go back to, say, in college for vacations. I always thought, you know, people would be happy to return home to their families um, during the holidays. Um, it wasn't until I went to college that I realized not everyone had a, what you might call a happy home that they were looking to, to, forward to, 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 um, to reuniting with. Not everyone came from a family where the parents were, were together and happy right. and so on. And so um, aside from that, in, in, with my sister, for example, and say the values of my parents, my sister contracted polio when she was three. Mm. I think something went wrong with the batch of... Um, of vaccines that she was given. She couldn't walk as from when she was three years old. And we all grew up knowing that, obviously. Now, was that a reason for her to be resentful towards life, towards others, not to have normal friendships? Absolutely not. In fact, I'm, I'm guilty, and I feel bad about this, of not even appreciating how challenging that must have been for her all through our years growing up, because it seemed like not a big deal. She was happy. We did things together. Obviously, she had she had um, physical inhibitions. Uh, there were things she couldn't do, and so on and so forth. But um, she was she was she's, she's still the most generous person I've ever known. She 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 doesn't think of herself as 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 being restricted of, of life as having dealt her an unfair hand. And yet I remember one, one incident, incident <laughs> or maybe one episode more like um, when she had, her baby was uh, three years old or so. 
and I was yeah. visiting, and um, a baby, the, the baby girl, was crawling towards a power outlet. Actually, I, I think her name's Neka. She was able to walk by then. She was actually walking, you know, taking those um, baby steps towards the power outlet, which obviously was dangerous. Um, yeah. um, and so her mother wanted to stop her from doing that. And she called out to her, but the lower the baby, she's still walking. And my sister had to get down on the floor on all fours and crawl to her baby who was beginning to walk. Right. Stop her. I was at the corner of the room looking at this. I don't know if she, she noticed I was there, but um, you know, I'm, I don't know that I should say I'm ashamed to say, but was, this was in my adulthood already, obviously, in my 30s, I believe. That was the first time it struck me so vividly that my sister could not walk. I had to turn away. There were tears in my eyes. I, I walked out of the room and, um, and I came back a few minutes later. But she's never let that deter her. So the, the, I guess the, the, the values my parents brought to us with that of um, you know, self-confidence, mm, self-assurance, that you're worth, that you're, you're worth a lot, that your, 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 your sense of self-worth does not depend on how much you possess or how big you are or how fast you can run. Or your sense of self, self-worth comes from within, from the kind of person you are and from the way you treat the people around you. Um, and that's another, I guess, of, of those things that I, I won't take for granted growing up, but that I'm so glad my parents instilled in us. When we talk with others who know you, students, colleagues, and friends, the recurring themes are authenticity and positivity. People feel understood by you, valued, and taken seriously. This is notably true for your students as well. Um, tell us a little bit about your interactions with students. Are there any? Uh, are there any? other episodes that, uh, that spring to mind in terms of your interaction with them and, uh, yeah, and how that's unique. Um, this past summer, I gave a class that I hadn't taught before. Um, and it was a basic finance class. Um, it's usually very rigorous and all that. The students find it somewhat intimidating, especially at the start. And to compound matters, it had to be entirely online because that was um, in the thick of the pandemic and we didn't quite know how to handle how to handle it. So it was an entirely online class, meaning there was no physical, if you like, interaction with the students. It was all over Zoom. And halfway through that class, one day my wife says to me, it was a Saturday, but halfway through that semester, I'm sorry, um, or perhaps the second half of the semester, my wife says to me, and she'd been telling me for three or four days leading to that Saturday. I wondered why, but I thought, oh, well, if she'd like to do that, I'm all game. She said, you know, we're going to have brunch on Saturday. Don't forget. I said, okay, but where are we going to have it? You know, the restaurants are closed. We'll, we'll find a way, don't worry. And she reminds me again, um, four days, you don't forget, Saturday we're going to have brunch. <laughs> so right. Okay. And so we drive to this place. And um, when nearing there, she says, um, maybe it's a bit early. Let's just stop by this other store, hang her out a bit, and then we'll get there by whatever time. All right, so we went to the drive into a parking lot of um, the place where we were supposedly going to have brunch. And we're getting out of the car, and then there were these college students in front of me with cookies and flowers. And, um, and I thought um, they're raising money for some cause, you know, and I thought, oh, hello, how are you guys? And then they say to me, hi, um, we're in your class. And my wife whips out her phone and is, is filming. <laughs> <laughs> So are you sure they would like you to like to be okay? You didn't ask their permission. And when the girls say to them, they're, they're, they're mostly girls, and they say, you know, we're in your class. I said, oh, really? Oh, that's nice. So I thought, well, they happen to be in my class, and they're working for some cause that's a noble cause. That's nice. Good to see you guys. And then I was walking up to the supposed place where we're going to have brunch. I said, no, no, this is for you. And, I, and then I look at my wife, and she looked, and I, see, I realized at that point that they had planned this together. So uh, the girls uh, apparently had sought out my wife on Facebook, had um, direct messaged her and told her they'd like to do this. Could she please organize this in tandem with them? Is there any way they could? So and they planned this behind my back. Now, these were students I had only ever met over Zoom, only in the classroom, so to speak, only discussing the fundamentals of business finance. And yet they they organized this, you know, to show 
I, I don't know why um, that experience in my class for them was so supposedly moving that they thought they, they had to express their gratitude to me in this manner. But it's something that manifests itself every time, every semester. But all of them to a person were grateful that I reached out to them. And I, I, that struck me again. What's abnormal about reaching out to them? But they, they were grateful that I, you know, that I showed an interest in them. And I'm glad they noticed that, but that's the reason I'm in education, you see, because I, um, it's a privilege. It's a privilege to play a role in somebody's shaping of their character, of the skills, of the whatever it is they'll they'll bring to the rest of their lives. I I count myself very lucky. Yeah, one of our mindsets at Maze is the global mindset, which we have touched on. Uh, how has your work on emerging African economies made an impact globally? I started, right, after working for nonprofits, I moved into higher ed, but the admin side of higher ed, I had just done my MBA as well. And then I moved into um, um, non-education, if you will, uh, business per se, in this time and in the entertainment industry, um, working on a on business model, business planning um, for a, for a production company that was going to start. Mm -hmm. But I got curious about, about economic performance of countries. And so I decided to go off on my own and do some research, which eventually turned out to be a two-year um, odyssey, if you will. <laughs> I, uh, I went off to England, um, started my own small consultancy to work on this precisely. And I, I was working on something that I discovered hadn't been done before, an approach that I hadn't taken before. And so I was flying blind. Indeed, I had reached out to people who I thought would know, including one gentleman who was the, a country representative of the World Bank in a particular country in an emerging economy. And he said to me, Tony, you're not, you're not going to find any, you're not going to find data to help you with the approach you're taking. And, you know, I, I don't know that it will work. And I can be quite stubborn. I said, OK, but I'm going to try. I, I think it's, it's, good, it's, good, it's possible. He said, all right, I wish you luck, young man, he said to me. And so I was working flying blind, like I said, for a year and a half on this. And I, I was done. But um, I needed a pair of eyes to go over my work. I reached out to, to a chap at the Financial Times. Um, I had tried to get through to them. I never found the person I wanted to reach whom I had a, someone had introduced me to. So I said, well, I can't seem to reach this guy. So I go onto their website, go to the very top, pick out a chap called Martin Wolf, who was a, the chief economics commentator. So I send him an email and ring him on the phone. To my surprise, he picks up the phone and he goes, who is this? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I said, we've never met Mr. Wolf, but um, my name is Tony Okoromadu. I sent you an email a few days ago. So it goes through his email uh, it's seemingly. And so I, I don't have an email here. What's your name again? I, I give to him and he goes, no, I don't see it. What do you want? You know, in that sort of, it, comes, it might come across as, as arrogant, but no, this is a guy who, you know, talks with presidents and prime ministers and all over the world, and this is this chap calling out of the blue. And so I explained to him, I say, listen, Mr. Wolf, um, I've got something that I'd like you to see. Um, it will take only five minutes. And if that, after five minutes, um, you're not persuaded, we'll just shake hands and I'll leave no hard feelings whatsoever. Um, he thinks about it for a few seconds. It was around Christmas time, just near Christmas. And he said, all right, um, there's no time the rest of this year, but maybe first thing next year. And I go, oh, thanks, that'll be nice. So, okay, um, what about first Monday, whatever, in the new year? Fantastic. Right. So I, I get off at the, um, in the city of London, the tube station. I, I'd been there, but I thought I knew my way around. Um, but I must be nervous. I, I got out of the wrong exit of the tube station and found myself darting into the Financial Times building just, I think, two or three minutes ahead of our appointment. And um, I said, I'm here to see Mr. Wolf. And they go, um, Oh, are you the one who was waiting for? He's just, he's just left. He was waiting here for you at the reception. Oh, yeah, man. But one of the uh, security guards very kindly said, well, hang on, he might not have gone far. I'll just go see if I can catch him. And he finds him going down the hallway. And Martin Wolf comes back. 
and I meet him for the first time. And he said, I said to him, well, my five minutes are counting already, aren't they? And he goes, yes. So we go to his office. I hand him the manuscript. He flips through the pages and he goes, you did all this yourself. <laughs> and I say, yes. And, you know, you could have knocked me over, Ben, at that point with a feather because it, it was just a wave of relief that swept through me. I thought to myself, gosh, I mean, what I was doing all these years might be worthwhile in the end. We went to his office, and that's just the half of it. We ended up speaking for upwards of 45 minutes. And that, for me, it did everything for me. It gave me such self-confidence that has just carried me to this day. It taught me about how when you're in a, not a privileged position in the sense that it was bestowed on you, but when, let's say when you're in a high position, so to speak, the impact you can have on others can be immeasurable. Because this guy gave me some minutes of his time. But that encounter with Martin Wolf has carried me to this day. And it's taught me, even if I think something is little in my interaction, with, in this case, students who are very tasty, you never know how far that bit of attention you've given them, that bit of consideration that you've taken them seriously as, as persons with, you know, of value. You've made them see that, or their intrinsic worth how impactful it can be unbeknownst to one. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible. It's pretty incredible, love that story. What do you think is the hardest part of developing a global mindset for our students here at Maze? In my opinion, you have to have lived in America to understand America and Americans. Um, okay. Now people here, there's a statistic that's a cliche now, but of the developed countries, Americans are the least likely to have an international passport. Hmm. Um, and I used to wonder at that. Yeah, it's a very small proportion of, of Americans that have an international passport, meaning a very small proportion of Americans that have actually traveled. Um, indeed, yeah. there's a saying that um, Europeans think 200 miles is a long distance, yeah. and Americans mm -hmm. think 200 years is a long time. <laughs> and so um, for, for Americans, we tend to see human uh, civilization as having begun in 1776. Um, the world before 1776 quite literally does not exist. And so we see um, the rest of the world in terms of how they compare in the yeah. last 50, 75, 100 years. Yeah. We don't see the rest of the world in terms of how they have shaped us, right? Even our very own civilization. If I said to my students that the numbers that we use, the letters number one, the way it's written, number two, number three, number four, that they're actually Arabic numerals, then they are surprised. Um, yeah. And so they don't, they don't have the sensation of, say, walking through ancient Rome. Or anywhere else in the world, you, know, you, you, you sit on a on, on on a concrete bench, and the sensation of knowing that a thousand six hundred years ago, somebody sat on this very same bench you're sitting in. Um, so that it, it's a challenge to, to, for them to have that global mindset because everything revolves around America as it has done for the past seventy five one hundred years. And so it's easy to get carried away with that. Um, but they very soon discover um, the many things that are outside of the U.S. and the depth of other cultures and even things like related to finance, the fact that the practice of, um, um, of options and futures was not invented by Wall Street. It was invented by the Dutch centuries ago. <laughs> yeah. you know, so they, they, they think, oh, there's a, there is a world outside of America, and things actually began outside of America. So it's usually an eye-opener for the students. One of the joys of, of teaching, I guess, you see um, the impact that you make on the students and, and how it broadens their worldview. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move to let's move to rapid fire. What important truth do very few people agree with you on? It shouldn't be political, but sadly, almost everything these days can be construed as political. We got, uh, in my ethics class, we're talking about 
gender pay gap and stuff. Mm -hmm. And the students are usually surprised to learn that in some, in other advanced countries, women get paid maternity leave. It's by law. And they're, they're surprised. And they go, uh, hang on, when you paid maternity leave. I say, yeah. They go six months with full pay um, um, maternity leave. That is really a surprise for them. And they want to run through the, the, the statistics. Another thing is healthcare, which is, <laughs> which is a contentious issue. <laughs> but yes. um, when they discover that other advanced nations, you know, healthcare is not such a big issue. And I go, yeah, but if the state pays for it, surely that is socialist. And um, if you told the Brits that they live in a socialist country, they'd get very upset. If you told yeah. the German that they were socialists, they, 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 they'd almost tear their mm-hmm. ears out. Um, and yet, they're not less well off than we are. Indeed, the GDP, GDP per capita of the Swiss is higher than the uh, GDP per capita that we've got. So you could say in a sense they are wealthier in spite, so to speak, of those um, policies. That's usually an, an eye-opener. Both. Yeah, absolutely. If you wrote an autobiography, what would you call it? May your road be rough. Yeah. That title is not original to me. Um, I saw it in an op-ed many, many years ago, but it's stuck. I haven't told you a hundredth of my life story, um, but it has had some very deep um, troughs, um, which is also helps when I encounter students going through maybe not similar troughs, but troughs nonetheless. Yeah. I'm able to, to, to help them and not just theoretically, which will be, be um, legitimate enough, but I have the, 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 the benefits, if you like, of being able to help them from personal experience. Yeah. Yeah. May, may your road be rough. Yeah. I like that. Is there anyone you would like to send good bull? Uh, if you woke me up at three in the morning, if you post me midstream at work at two forty-five in the afternoon, I'd give you the same answer. It's my wife. I owe her everything. What I said Martin Wolf did for me as far as my professional life, professional sense of self-worth goes, she did and does for me as far as my entire being goes. She, um, she's literally my soul. She's everything. She's everything. She she completes me. I, I can't I can't bear to think of five minutes uh, um, without her my away from her. So yeah, that that's the easiest question you posed to me all, all morning. <laughs> well, good bull to her. So good bull to her, and good bull to you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Tony. We really appreciate oh, no, your thanks. Time it's today. it's an honor. It's a privilege. Uh, thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> but thanks for <laughs> thanks for putting up with me. We really appreciate that, uh, the time. That was easy. <laughs> Very well then. Have a good one, yeah? We hope you enjoyed the episode. That Tony was very interesting. For our Mastercast top three takeaways, I wanted to start with the end in mind. So he talked about his autobiography of May Your Road Be Rough and how... <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Yeah, maybe not the happy sitcom, but I think it is a good sentiment because when you think about the things that have built character, those are the things that are hard in life. And Tony really talked about how losing his father, his sister having polio, the lessons he learned from the challenges his father had, that those were the lessons in life that built his truest character and how all of his siblings grew up with gratitude and forgiveness because of some of the challenging experiences that they've had. And while we would, of course, never wish challenge on anyone, it is something to be grateful for most of the time. Yeah. It's not a curse, but it's sort of a, it's considered like a, like a backhanded blessing in the Eastern world. And that is, may you live in interesting times Mm. or may your life be interesting. So that's kind of where my mind goes when you say that. I like that because... I mean, my goodness, if that doesn't define the times that we're in right now, right? We're living in interesting times. And there's certainly a lot of tragedy with that that I wish we could avoid. But there's also a lot of learning with that about ourselves, about each other that comes with those experiences that maybe are well-defined as interesting. 
Yeah. One of the defining features of 2020 is that we've had to pull together in a lot of ways, some more willingly than others. But in the end, we're all the same species and we are stewards of this planet together. Uh, So we have to find a way to reach that, to move toward that common goal. And I think that segues nicely to a second takeaway, which is that the world didn't start in 1776. See, I don't I don't even believe that. I don't even believe that. <laughs> You're a 1776er? Yep, I'm a 1776er. <laughs> that... Flat Earth. The, the Flat Earth was formed in 1776 in six days. <laughs> Tweet Ben if you have complaints. Don't, don't bring those <laughs> to me. No, I, I think it's... Uh, good reminder. Of course, we know that our egocentric attitudes sometimes make that easy to forget that things didn't start here. And there is so much to learn about the origin of things and the history of things and kind of going to the final takeaway of complacency and that the biggest challenge that our students face or that we as a nation face when it comes to having a global mindset is complacency, that we think that the way that we do things is the best way. And there's so much to learn from other countries, from organizations in other countries, from other people, from other countries that we miss out so much if we assume that the way that we do it in America is the best way or the only way or the first way. I think there's a very fine line between patriotism and jingoism, I guess. And to me, the correct perspective is to be to be proud of our nation with all of its warts, but also to acknowledge that we're not getting everything right and to figure out, all right, what can we be doing better? And to live from a curious place and a scientific place in terms of figuring out, all right, how can this nation take the next best step? Sometimes we do a good job of that. Sometimes we don't do such a good job of that. But I do think that I don't think there's anything wrong with being proud of America and to think that it is a great nation. I mean, right. it, sort of by definition, it is a great nation, but I certainly don't think we get everything right. And I think that there are some very recent, very obvious examples of things that other countries are just doing better than we are. What Tony said about Americans not having international passports I think our lack of perspective comes from lack of perspective. It comes from not having seen other countries, not being exposed. And, you know, even when Tony talked about how in Europe, 200 miles is far, if you just take that issue, let's have the best intentions. Americans may be well traveled by miles, if we think about it that way. 200 miles here is not far. And yet, we've seen only America because it is hard. You know, here there's so much more landmass that there's just farther to travel to get to something that's different. And versus in Europe, you could go to a bunch of different countries in a very short period of time very easily. Whereas here, that's just not the case. You might go to a bunch of different states, but it's still going to take you a day to get across Texas. And so we just don't have the perspective. That's definitely a compelling point. I I do think that there's a fair bit of difference between downtown Houston and Carn City. But from a cultural perspective, it certainly doesn't vary as much as crossing, you know, from through three European countries in the space of a few hours. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you want to close this with a quote? Well, I don't know how I feel about that. (laughs) You would love to. I know how you feel about that. Uh, Okay, you got me. (laughs) Don't merely practice your art. Instead, force your way into its secrets. Beethoven. Beautiful. Thanks for listening. And if you have a chance to subscribe or to drop us a five-star review, we would greatly appreciate it. An MBA from Texas A&M University can take your career to a whole new level. With full-time and weekend options, Texas A&M suits your schedule. So get a better gig. Visit mba.tamu.edu. Looking to start a podcast? Trying to tackle questions like, how do I record? How do I edit? How can I get music for my show? What equipment do I need? How do I distribute it? Good news. The podcast architects are here to help. Whether that's from start to finish, fixing the audio quality, helping you get the episodes posted, go to podconsulting.co. Everyone has something worth sharing with the world.